Thank you everyone so much for showing up for the uh, early morning panel of uh, gender and sexuality in interactive fiction. Uh, and uh, this is the second time we've run this panel. We ran it last year at GamerX. Uh, it was fantastic, so we decided we we're going to run it again. Uh, and we said that everyone would introduce themselves this year, so I'm just going to pass it down oh, this way. Oh, great. I <laughs> chose the right seat, I guess. Yep. Uh, I'm Zach Sergi. Uh, I am an author of interactive fiction, specifically the Heroes Rise trilogy for a company called Choice of Games. Um, so Choice of Games uh, is a fantastic publisher of interactive fiction. And they might be a little bit different than other publishers because they have a lovely language called Choice Script, which is written by this man right here. Um, and it's a really cool place because they not only have authors that come and write books for them, but they also have a, a large fan base of hosted games. So you can go and write your own interactive fiction on their website that they will some, may sometimes maybe publish for you. Uh, and uh, so I am an author of the Heroes Rise trilogy. The third one actually just came out yesterday, which is really cool. Um, and it's set in a world where superheroes have become the ultimate celebrities, and you're a young superhero trying to uh, become famous. Uh, and you get to make choices about who you date and what your sexuality is um, and what your gender is or not uh, throughout the entire book. And uh, the cool thing about Choice of Games is that, yes, you have control over what happens in the game, but you also are trying to build a character. So you get to make choices between key statistics. So in Heroes Rise, for example, you get to choose if you want to be famous or if you want to uphold justice or if you want to follow the law or break the law or in the nation that you protect, do you value security or do you value freedom? Um, so the game kind of forces you to make these moral decisions as superheroes usually have to do um, as you go through. And I guess that's, that's my spiel. Thanks. Hi, I'm Porpentine and um, I make games and new media art and uh, it's pretty cool. Thanks. I'm Christine Love, and I'm here basically to make this panel a bit more shiny. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I make visual novels, um, games about um, um, stories and romances, mostly. Um, I made um, um, Analog and Hate Plus, and my current project is um, a lesbian bondage porn game called My Twin Brother Made Me Cross Dresses Him, and Now I Have to Deal with a Geeky Stalker and a Dom <laughs> Beauty Who Want Me in a Bind. Or please, just call it Lady Killer in a Bind for short. Don't, don't, don't try to say that full name to me. It, it, it's, it's really hard. <laughs> Um, I'm Aaron Reed. I um, <clears throat> used to mostly do parser-based interactive fiction, so sort of in the text adventure style, um, and uh, made a much too long piece called Blue Lacuna four or five years ago. <laughs> um, uh, uh, that's in the uh, IndieKid Expo upstairs, which is cool. Um, uh, more recently, I've been doing kind of more uh, uh, kind of experimental stuff, so I did a piece called 18 Cadence that was kind of like combining magnetic fridge poetry with narrative. Um, I uh, worked on a game called Prom Week that used AI of social simulations uh, and interactive narrative. And I'm currently working on both uh, a project also with Choice of Games uh, set in 1950s Hollywood and a augmented reality uh, interactive narrative uh, that I'm making with my boyfriend. So happy to be here. Hi, um, I'm Squinky, also known as Dear Drakii. Um I am most well known for Dominique Pomplamos in It's All Over Once the Fat Lady Sings, a stop motion musical detective adventure game about gender and the economy. <laughs> um, uh, it was nominated for four IGF awards and won none of them. <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> so uh, currently I am working on even weirder stuff. Um, my latest project, an interactive play called Coffee A Misunderstanding, um, is, uh, I, is being run tomorrow at noon in um, Alienware Workshop Room A. So if you've got nothing better to do at that time, come and be part of something weird and bizarre and magical. It's really cool. You should all go. <laughs> All right, nifty. Uh, and I'm Dan Fabulich, and I work at Choice of Games also, uh, and we publish games, just like Zach said. All right, so before this, uh, before this panel, we uh, put out a call on Twitter to see if other people had questions. So we have a collection of questions here, but we've also got plenty of time to uh, answer questions from the audience. Uh, I figured I would just start with our first question that came from the community, and this was about uh, uh, asexuality. Uh, the question as phrased, uh, the lack of sexual attraction to either gender has been chronically underrepresented in the media, but especially gaming. At the moment, it is almost always coupled with something negative, like a lack of human emotion or a lack of genitalia. Uh, 
what are good and healthy ways of representing asexuality uh, in games and in interactive fiction in particular, and how do you foresee this changing? Uh. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, this is this is a topic of interest to me. Um, uh, I, I myself am not strictly asexual, but um, have leaned that way a few times, and. Um, a lot of the stories I write, like um, Dominique Pomplamous, for instance, um, just like the the main character, like doesn't um, like engage in any like sexual or romantic things at all, and it's just not an issue. It just doesn't come up, and I find in a lot of ways like a great way to like. If it just doesn't come up, like sometimes you, you'd think that's the best way to represent something, but at the same time, if it doesn't come up, then people are like, do people read that as asexual or do they read that as um, like, assuming everyone is straight and cisgender unless they say otherwise? So I, I, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Like, uh, do you have to like uh, do you have to talk about it and make it an issue to make it visible? And that's one of those things. And I deal with the same uh, issue um, in creating uh, creating non-binary characters um, and and any and like just anything else. Like um, in an ideal world, you don't want to make it an issue. You don't you don't even want it to come up. Like you just don't you just don't care. You don't want people asking you these questions. Um, but but like a huge part of um, like there's like the reality of the world we live in is such that um, so many like um, default assumptions to norms are being made and um, and like people will assume you're a certain way unless you say things otherwise and and so like um, yeah I've yeah that's uh, what what do you all think <laughs> I mean, it's very true that there's all these idealized images associated with, like, no matter how you identify, people will have, like, this idea of what it looks like to be queer or trans or gay or bi or asexual, and it can be frustrating. So, yeah, definitely. Um, I'll jump in if no one else has something. Uh, um, so I think, so there have been, you know, a couple panels yesterday we're talking about, um, you know, various, you know, economic and social difficulties in being inclusive in sort of AAA games. Um, and one of the things I really love about working in interactive fiction where like a sole creator can create something is that you, um, you really do have the flexibility and um, uh, just ability in general to, um, to have a lot of different um, alternatives and options. Um, so one of the things as I'm working on my Choice of Games project that I'm really thinking about is um, how to let people um, uh, really pick like sort of their own victory conditions. So there are two possible um, love interests in the game, but I also want to make it, you know, like you can get a perfectly, you know, um, exciting, happy ending by ignoring both of them, right? Like you're not forced to pick one or the other. Um, uh, and so, so there, a lot of the game hinges are all in sort of work-life balance question, and I want there to be a winning ending where you balance those two things, um, and in the, uh, the life part can be romance or no romance, right? Um, where you balance those, where you pick one of them and pursue that to the exclusion of the other, um, or vice versa. So, um, so that's you know, four or five different kind of ending states, which um, uh, in a game with a big budget, people would say, well, that's way too many, we need to cut these and trim it down. Um, but I can do that because it's just me, and I can stay up late and write. So, yeah. um, so I really like the flexibility that the medium affords for stuff like that. Another thought I had was, um, uh, like, what about the question of romantic asexuals versus aromantic asexuals, or aromantic allosexuals, or what have you, or uh, or any combination um, of the above, demisexuals and gray asexuals and such, like, it's it's a spectrum, and um, there are a lot of ways to do relationships, and not all of them, not all of them involve like sex in a conventional sense. Um, like, there's a, uh, like, so, 
And, and I mean, there's also like polyamory and kink, all that can come into play there. And uh, it's, it's really, it can get really complex and interesting. Um, and, and basically, like, I think the best way to represent um, the, co the complexity of human relationships is to just have diverse ensemble casts um, and not make anyone into a token that re represents what something is all about. What I love about doing these panels um, is that I always think about things differently. So, and I, it's also something when you finally publish something and people read it, you get feedback and you realize things that you never would have thought of. So when I first wrote The Hero's Rise, um, and I, it kind of operates in the young adult category, so it's like, of course there's gonna be a big romance, it's young adult. Um, but a lot of readers were writing back and saying, I don't wanna be in this romance, don't force me to be. So I had to make a choice where you could or you couldn't. And then by the end, you can be in five different romances or none. So. Um, I never thought of asexuality as an option necessarily until readers came back and said, hey, I want this, um, which is the cool thing about interactive fiction is that um, you are trying to please the most amount of people and in doing that you learn a lot about what people really want. I would object to the fact that you are always trying to please the most amount oh, of people. Yeah, I, I think it very yeah. much depends on a case-by-case -case basis. <laughs> um, yeah, but no, no, like, um, yeah, it definitely depends on what you're trying to do. Um, I had some thoughts actually about what we're talking about, like romance and sexuality and whatnot. Just like, I think it's really important to stress like the possibilities of like, I don't know. I feel like there's this hierarchy where romantic love and friendship is like placed on a, a higher, like romantic and sexual love is placed on a higher hierarchy than uh, placed on the hierarchy than most things. And it's really important to emphasize friendships as well and emphasize. Because like it's very unstable to like base everything on romantic love, yeah. when friendships I feel are like the most radical thing to form communities out of, and to like to like be able to love people without those other things. I really agree with that. I th I think one of the traps I think a lot of people can get into with romance plots and games is they'll say, oh well, you know, it's an optional subplot. So if you want to play asexual, you can just opt out of that plot completely. You just won't have a romantic relationship. You'll be on the other main path of the game, and you just won't have close relationships with the other characters in the game. Which, like, wait, that wasn't yeah. that wasn't the point. Like, what about a close relationship where like there isn't like any like conventional sex per se, but it's still like very intimate. Like, I think that is like very beautiful and needs to be represented because, you know, not everyone is the same. One of the things I really like about the black magic relationship in particular is that there is sort of a cuddle romance option where like, <laughs> no, we're not in bed having sex right now. We're in bed and cuddling. That's what we're doing. That's what we do together. Uh, and it's uh, just a really different approach. And like, that so totally ties into just like the idea, this heterosexual, well like the normative heterosexual idea of like, like sex in orgasm and coming is just like the ultimate goal and everything else below that is you're losing like cuddling is losing and you're <laughs> yeah. friend zoned or whatever and just like that it's it positions people as like objects of acquisition and like scoreboards and like things to be acquired which yeah like like i was saying when we should be valuing friendships so much as well yeah the friend zone isn't a place you banish people you don't like to <laughs> <laughs> It's where the people I like go. So that, that brings me to a question I wanted to ask Christine about. <clears throat> okay, so I, I promised I would do this in a, in a voice that uh, Christine asked me to be a coy yet titillated. <laughs> <laughs> my, my twin brother made me cross dress as him, and now I have to deal with a geeky stalker and a dumb beauty who want me in a bind. Perfect. All right, thank you. <laughs> I, um, coy and titillated. <laughs> I actually usually refer to it by the short acronym Mutipa Makahani So one of the remarks you made while talking about this game is that it, in, in contrast with a lot of other games which treat sort of romance and, and, and sex as the victory condition of a sort of vending machine that like you plunk in coins and you, you manipulate the other characters into getting to do what you want, this game is going to have something really different from that in it. I want 
given you a chance to talk about that. Sure. Um, it's, it's, it's a very sex-focused game, like, um, as, as porn game um, seems to, to indicate. But, well, like, like a lot of, you know, traditionally, they still follow the same arc where you chase the girl, you get the girl, you get one sex scene, maybe a couple, if it's really saucy. <laughs> and that's the end. Like, that's the win condition, is you've got the girl, that's like, and here's your prize, which is not really how relationships, I don't know, I've never had a relationship like that, maybe, maybe other people have. Maybe Bioware actually just all of their love goes like that. That's really interesting. But, so instead, we're, it's, um, it's, a, it's a game that's set over the span of seven days, um, and we're basically just gonna follow the relationship, build on that, and every night there's going to be a sex scene. Um, it's going to be hot, but it's also going to, you know, develop characters, it's gonna develop the relationship. Because, so like, what seems ridiculous to me is that, you know, in most traditional games, you have this ideal where the first time you have sex is like the reward, but usually the first time you have sex with someone, it's like kind of clumsy <laughs> as you're like figuring out people. Like, it's, it doesn't really seem like the pinnacle to me. It seems like the start. And as you learn more and you learn more about this person and how to communicate with them, both verbally and, and non-verbally, um, the relationship builds. Like, it feels ridiculous to say that the relationship is the chase rather than what happens next. So we're just gonna start out with, here's the relationship and we'll, how is it built from there? It's, we'll explore that through sex, cause I like sex. <laughs> and so like, um, we did actually like have to consider during development and I'm not entirely sure I feel confident about the decision we came to here, but we thought what, what if um, the player does want to play asexually in this and Honestly, the answer is because we're making a game about sex, we want to focus on, like, we want to be tightly focused. I mean, I, I know Aaron said um, that one of the benefits of interactive fiction is you can do anything, but at the same time, like, I do want to have, like, a very narrow focus. Like, I want to do what we're doing extremely well rather than trying to be overly broad, which but, is, I don't know, like, when AAA developers say that this story had to be about a man, I get annoyed at that, but at the yeah. same time, I, I'm definitely, like, tightly focusing on a very sexual protagonist, and I don't know if that's the right answer, but it's, it feels like the, what we have to do in order to, in order to pull it off. I was just gonna say, what you're doing does fall under the category of doing whatever you want, so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another question we had from, our, from, from Twitter, uh, actually two questions, mostly the same. Uh, advice for including transgender characters in games. Uh, in particular, uh, one detailed question. How do you include a transgender character in a way that's respectful without saying, this is my transgender, transgender friend Jane, who used to be James. Oh, uh, you know, how do this. you do this? Okay, so you have a scene. Let's take your average scene. You know, people are like maybe in a park. Um, an airplane zooms overhead. There's this tiny dot in the sky. Closer, closer, bigger and bigger, a parachute blooms from behind it. It swings back and forth. They come to a halt on the earth, skipping along, and they shrug the parachute off, and then they're like, hi, I'm transgender. I'm trans with a transgender. Um, no, just don't put any cis characters in your game. Make them all trans. We have to have a moratorium for the next 80 years. And um, then we'll see where we're at then. OK, thanks. <laughs> Have a character come and say, hi, I'm sis. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad we settled this question. <laughs> Wait, so what was the question? Well, I mean, I... <laughs> How do you put a trans character in your game, like, respectfully? Yes. Um, is this presumably from the perspective of someone who's not trans? You know, uh, the question asker didn't say. Uh, but I, certainly I think it is implicit that... I, I think it'd be more useful for people who aren't trans to like, yeah, I think that'd probably be more likely to come, but, um, huh. When I, what I read in the question was that this person was impl implying, I'm going to have a transgender character. I'm not going to make all my characters trans, which maybe is a mistake, right? But, it you know, could be. how do you, how do you I, represent that? Well, first of all, it's like, do you have trans friends? If you don't have trans friends, like... I'm not you saying do. go you out. You just and don't know it. But that you is do. that's also highly possible. But I'm just saying that like things tend to be like very like stratified and like 
if you don't have trans friends, don't go to like the store and buy some, but like maybe <laughs> examine why you don't have trans friends and like a variety of friends. Um, and then secondly, when it comes to like actual representation, like, yeah, like have trans people in your games because it's really, I don't know, when I see media where it's just like cis people sitting around, it's really, weird and it like feels like this world in which like okay if I watch like Game of Thrones it looks like this world where like all trans people were genocided and like it's really depressing um, or like if I go to like a restaurant even IRL and like it's just like all cis people it just feels kind of depressing although that's like every restaurant but like still it just it's like what's wrong with that th th we don't like actually have people just like sitting around feeling comfortable being trans in public uh, that's kind of a tangent, but... Um. Well, let, me, let me try to rephrase the question yeah. then. I feel like uh, a number of the games of some of the panelists, uh, players have really actively misgendered the PC. Yes. Oh, uh, and yes. You know, like, the goal was I'm going to have a trans PC, and yet uh, you would have maybe very likely cis players who assumed incorrectly that they were playing a cis character. They insert their cisness inside the... Mm -hmm. What is to be done? Game. I, all, okay, all my protagonists are like, they're basically trans for the most part, like, or like a, a feminine person, certainly. Um, and yeah, people will be like, oh yeah, I was playing this like dude or whatever, because like I don't, I do write it with a, a light touch, like I don't really like super embody it, like, so yeah, like when you do have this like lightness to, to it, people will insert themselves, and of course, People, people's default is white and cis and able-bodied. That's like the able, that, that is the default that everyone assumes. So, how do you it's not your fault. How do you overcome this assumption? Is there, I mean, maybe the answer is like, well, just keep making games. It's their and fault, it, it's not my fault. Fair enough. Well, I, well, I don't want to point fingers, is I guess my point. I want to help them fingers. learn that there are, farewell. Let's point fingers and help them learn. No? Um, I think like it's certain, mm, I don't know, I think people coming from a position of privilege can certainly do a lot to educate themselves, I hate to say it, but like to stop like, okay, treating trans people like they're on a pedestal or of some sort, like whether it's negative or positive, I feel like there's this very clinical approach that I really don't like and it, I'd really like to see just more camaraderie and like mingling of people, if that makes sense. Instead of like, being like, okay, you're trans, you're the token, show up, or like, I don't know. It's hard, it's very hard for me to articulate actually, sorry. Well, I was gonna, so going back to the question, I think it, the question might be phrased incorrectly because you never want, you wanna build characters that are people first, right? So to say that the first thing about them is that they're transgendered or gay or anything is probably incorrect, right? So first thing you want to do is hopefully, if you're, if you're doing your job, build a character that, that people think is a person. So I, there's a transgender character in, in Heroes Rise that you don't know is transgendered until much later. And it really doesn't actually matter that much to the character. Um, and then I set up a situation where the actual only kind of like discrimination that the transgendered character faces is from a gay character, so which is something that was important to me because I think there are lots of things that we all face and one of the things is that even within our own community we don't treat each other well all the time. So that was one of the things that I wrote into the second Heroes Rise and a lot of people didn't like, which was fine with me because I was like as long as people start talking about it that makes me happy. Yeah, I want to ask, I wanted to ask about more about that. So there's a particular scene which was pretty controversial in which a number of characters are arguing about well, they're arguing about gender, but they're also arguing about how we treat each other. Just first describe the scene and then describe some of the reaction you got to it. So the first thing I'll say about it is that it probably wasn't the best thing I've ever written. So objectively, I don't think it was, it was I, I could have handled it better maybe is the first thing. But beyond that, the goal of the scene was um, there are a lot of gay characters and transgender characters. and. Um, what I wanted was kind of a discussion about how, especially as a gay male, I have experienced that some of the nastiest things that anyone's ever said to me have been from other gay men, actually. Um, so it was coming from a place of, hey, why don't we like learn to treat each other better? Like it's, we've adopted this stereotype, especially gay men, and I'm from Los Angeles, so it's a pretty terrible example, or the worst example maybe, um, of just gay men being awful to each other. So. Um, 
and there are two gay characters, one of whom is um, very overweight and in kind of a, a wheelchair as a result, and the other one is kind of like a party boy pretty guy and treats the one in the wheelchair really terribly. So it comes from that relationship, and then they all kind of start having this really nasty fight with each other um, when really what they should be doing is supporting each other. So that was the point of the scene. Whether I achieved it, I don't know. <laughs> but it, How do you feel like people reacted to that scene? Uh, the, people, the, the people who understood it were like, or, or even the people who were upset about it, ultimately if I got to say anything to them, they were talking about it. And I was like, I didn't, I don't, I didn't have any answers in the scene. I just wanted to, to get people talking about something like this, which ended up happening. So I think that's really important. I think that's really important because it's important to be internally critical. Um, like, it's a form of respectability politics to, be, to try to say, like, we have to present ourselves as a marginalized people in a way that is, like, so pure. It, like, purity is very stressful. Um, and, yeah, like, it's really important to be like, yeah, like, people within this spectrum of queerness or LGBT or whatever term you like to use are, can be really shit to each other because there's no way to like get the shitness to stop until you like actually start talking about it. Let's take some questions from the audience. So I'm gonna run down and I'm Audience gonna questions. Isn't there a mic right up there? Oh, wow. <laughs> this is awkward. <laughs> you have to stand in front of us like a sacrifice, okay? <laughs> you can stand in front of us any way you like. Yes, um, that's Sacrificially. True. So I guess uh, that question like made sense to me from the standpoint of like feeling that you can enjoy the narrative of the game better when represented. Because like I can play a AAA game and I can be like, well, of course the, the Gears of War guys are gay. Like they're not showing any sex on screen. <laughs> so because they're not showing any sex, I can imagine all the sex I want. It doesn't conflict with anything they're saying in the game. But are they? But aren't and, they like, asexual? They're not. Are they? Well, but like, as I'm saying, like from my head canon, I can do what I want with right, it because yes. there's nothing in the game that contradicts it. So I can be like, okay, Link is trans. Like it's always made sense to me. Like Sheik is also. You know, like I, I can say these things, and it, there's nothing to contradict it. But there's something really powerful about something in the game confirming an identity that doesn't feel represented. So like a light hand can be like really great for people who like want to feel normal. Of course, they all want to feel normal. You know, I, I'm not <laughs> um, but, but like, yeah, like I feel like that's like, how do you give a nod to the people who want to be like, oh, like this person's like me, or this person has similar experiences to me, like without it feeling like. How do I know it's not all in my own head? How do right, I? Right, like how is it not just my head canon and I'm doing this to enjoy a game that obviously is made for people who are gonna mostly just like call me slurs in, in multiplayer, <laughs> like, you know. Everyone in Gears of War is trans. <laughs> They're deeply repressing a lot of things. It's, I can confirm this, uh, Nintendo told me this directly. <laughs> <laughs> like for example, with the Zelda trailer, it was like really exciting to a lot of people because we're like, oh, that's Zelda, finally. Like, finally it's Zelda in the trailer as the hero. Link has like, transitioned. Oh, it's not. You know, like, oh, it's not, but then people are still like, well, maybe it's. It is Link, <laughs> but Link has uh, gone on HRT, hormone replacement therapy, and is taking <laughs> estrogen and spironolactone. And um, Link is now much more fulfilled and is not going to go in those disgusting dungeons and will actually spend a lot of time hanging out in the really nice forest village where <laughs> she grew up. So. I knew that um, naming Link Zelda was like, <laughs> like a clue. You know how uh, when you name Link Zelda in the early games, like uh, <laughs> Easter eggs happen and stuff, and the game becomes really harder. Maybe, maybe that's like part of, that's definitely supports that canon there. <laughs> Link is Zelda. Thank God. <laughs> you could always pull a J.K. Rowling and be like. I don't think it's like super meaningful. So I don't know. I'm not looking for that within AA, AAA games at all, even. like Because I feel that even when you get trans representation within AAA, it's going to be so far behind. It's just going to be so like limited and like people are already making great games with like trans people in them right now great games with every kind of person it's just a matter of like um paying attention and like valuing that like i just don't care about that stuff that's all yeah but, but the I graphics mean, like, are cool yeah <laughs> but 
But uh, I mean, like, if you are um, a game developer um, working at a big AAA company, like, sometimes, like, the whole like thing of slipping in an Easter egg, it has to be kind of the secret initiative of one person who kind of just slips in through the cracks and has like one dialogue line that's a reference to some meme or something that only like people of your community will get. <laughs> and that's that's a way you can do it. But um, but I don't know, in the uh, in the like commercial game industry world, like if you, like, usually you don't have, like, a grand vision. You have a lot of, like, conflicting views of people on, like, who these characters are, and usually they will be biased somewhat normatively just because that's how the game industry skews. And even if you are, like, um, even if there's, like, one or just a few people who, um, like, want, who, like, are just, like, yeah, this character is definitely queer, like, convincing the rest of your team that that is the case. It's, like, it's, it's a whole other thing of politics. So, I don't know, if you want direct confirmation, um, playing games by independent developers is probably your best bet. <laughs> well, in particular, though, if you are an independent developer, what, what should you be doing? Yeah, so as an independent developer, obviously you have a lot more leeway, right? So I think the best solution is just, you know, just say in the game, right? Yes, like this is who this character is and it's fine. Um, uh, the, um, so sorry, let me back up one question. <laughs> um, uh, in, in a larger context, the analogy that occurs to me is um, uh, in Hollywood, uh, which I've been researching a lot of uh, um, for this project, um, uh, when the Hays Code was in effect, um, uh, screenwriters and directors were like extremely limited in what they could show on screen, and there was this huge list of things you could not have in movies. Um, and some of them just sort of um, took that as a challenge to like, well, what can I slip in there anyway? So like people like Hitchcock were always like working these dirty little double entendres into like their screenplays, and it's like, well, technically they didn't say anything there, but everyone knows what that means, right? So I think there's tricks. And I'm actually surprised you don't see more of that in AAA games, because it could so easily be done. Um, uh, um, and you know, even today when we don't have a Hays Code, you still see this in Hollywood all the time. So like uh, the South Park movie, the original title was South Park Goes to Hell. And they're like, oh, well, you can't have hell in a title. So they just renamed it to South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, right? <laughs> um, and the, <laughs> those guys have frequently done that. Like whenever the censors or, or you know, anyone says you shouldn't have this, they just put in something that is worse, but not technically against whatever rule they're supposed to be violating. Um, so I think there are ways you can sort of subversively, um, uh, you know, um, say what you want to say and also make fun of the people who are telling you you shouldn't be saying that at the same time. Um, but, you know, I haven't, I'm speaking from a position of not having worked for a big game company, so I don't really know, you know, what that experience is like, and I know it's difficult, but I think, I think there are things you can do like that. It's, it's also an interesting dilemma once you start writing. So, my games are written in the second person, as a lot of interactive fiction is, right? So, it's you do this, you do that. So, you have to build a character where the main character is whoever is reading, which is really exciting for the reader, but also it's difficult as the author because one wrong detail for that reader and the kind of the experience is off for them. So, for me, I, I, I just kind of ask you in the beginning, like, what's your gender, or if you don't have a gender, or um, what's your sexuality? Maybe I'll start asking if you don't have a sexuality, because you can be asexual. I like that, the idea of that. Um, and then from there, I don't, I try not to say, like, I don't say how old you are, I don't say much. It's leaving it, a light touch is a good way to put it, leaving it as open-ended for me so that you can fill yourself into the story. Like, most of the time when I come up with characters, I can see them in my head, but when I'm writing the main character, I don't, I try not to see anything because it's going to be anyone who's reading it. So that's, it's an interesting challenge because um, one false detail or one Easter egg that's wrong kind of turns off the experience. And the beautiful thing about interactive fiction is you can code to kind of weed out a lot of that if you know a little bit about what the player's preferences are. But um, for me, it's exciting because you can get, um, you know, a transgender teenager or a 40 year old man playing the same game and having an equally, um, uh, hopefully, enjoyable experience. Yeah, that, that is one of the superpowers and also super weaknesses of interactive fiction in that you have this capacity to be ambiguous about a lot of things. So the player can totally read that stuff in. And yet, because there's that room for ambiguity, players can read, I don't know, 
I'll call them the wrong things in, and you know, say, oh yeah, I'm gonna misgender that character, I'm gonna do this thing, because you, know, you didn't say on any page of Howling Dogs that I am trans, and so now I must be cis, that's how it works, right? Uh, yeah, so you know, both that power of ambiguity and the, 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 the weakness of ambiguity is that it lets those, those misgenderings through. One of the other questions we had from the community was, actually, I'm sorry, can I just Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I, I, I just feel like, like part of the problem here is that we're sort of conflating like how do we represent identities with how do we represent experiences? I think the latter is a lot more interesting. Like if you have a page of the manual that says certain character is trans or a lesbian or whatever, if you have um, a footnote that says um, um, long after the books are published that Dumbledore is gay, this is just telling you about their identity, but it's not actually reflecting like what their experience with that is in any way. And like, does that really matter? Is that really interesting? Like it's one thing to look at a character and go, oh yeah, that person describes themselves in the same way as me and then not have any, any further information, I think that's a lot less important than actually like showing what that experience is. So it's a lot harder to ignore or to misgender a character when somehow you're seeing how that's relevant and actually showing like this is an experience you can relate to. And I mean, like the question was about like trans characters, you will have a diversity of experiences. Most people will probably not relate to any given narrative. And so it's more just about not saying that here is a person that identifies in a certain way. You say, here's a person, these are what their experiences are. You'll probably relate to some of them, maybe not all. And in that way, you can explore that in a way that's probably a lot better than just saying, oh yeah, they're, they're gay, they're trans. <laughs> Doesn't matter. No, that's I, super I important that. because it's like, you I don't like want to lot. be checking off, you know, check boxes. Like that's not what it's about. It's not about fulfilling a quota. And it's like, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. Like the first thing I said was like, like why don't you have trans friends or no trans people or no other like tons of trans game designers or whatever. And like, cause that's where it comes from. It's like, it, it's life. It's like what we're living and doing. It's like the ga games are fucking shit. Like, Make a game after you're good at, at life. I don't know. That sounds bullshit. But yeah, it, it kind of is. I don't know. No, it is, no, no, no. That's not what I meant at all. Redact that. I just mean like have actual relationships with other trans people, where, with, with like, trans people where they're, you're showing them respect and like getting to know them and stuff. Like that's the best way to do it, honestly. Like to and. Uh, about experience, like that is so important because not everyone's experiences are the same. And it's like, like you're alluding to like, okay, one trans person is not another trans person, it's not another trans person. Like when you say, when we say trans, like I feel like a lot of times in like a lot of scenes that trans kind of is conflated to mean like, uh, like white and, and skinny and able-bodied and all these other things that it, it cannot possibly, and like when it has that attachment, like okay, an example from my experience would be when people say the word woman, um, I feel depressed. Like when I see a lot of feminist rhetoric going around that talks about women, I know they're talking about cis women. And that's an example of how a lot of feminism can be more depressing and like more harmful like than even this oppressive status quo would be so i would i think representing those experiences is really important because like i am i didn't go to college i'm super poor uh i'm not like i deal with chronic pain and like a lot of those things are not represented when people say trans or woman or whatever like, and that's super important to me as like an artist to be like, you don't have to do those things or be those things. You can still, you still deserve respect. And that's um, a valid uh, experience. Yeah. I have a lot of things to say. Um, so I hope I get to all of them because like you've just like, there's, there's a lot of thoughts going on. I'm really sorry. I'm bad at panels. Um, uh, okay, so. All right, so um, uh, one thing I have been doing lately on the topic of experiences versus identity is that like um, when you're designing a game, um, especially like if you do, if you write code at all, 
there um, when you have when you have characters, um, you will usually um, you will usually like have attributes of your characters, like um, like usually when you're designing when you have like when you are modeling a character in code, you will like give them a gender like male, female, or male, female, non-binary, or male, female, whatever, 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 all these things, um, and, um, and all sorts of other attributes. Um, I have stopped doing that um, because identity is weird and fluid and incomprehensible. I have trouble like expressing what my gender identity is and what my sexuality is, so, um, so like, I've decided to only really model what is relevant. What is relevant is like what pronouns you use to refer to someone. So I will have like, I will have like, I will have like, you can choose what pronoun, like uh, I will choose what pronouns um, like somebody, like uh, you should use to refer to this character and also have the ability for those pronouns to change um, in the middle of a game or something. Um, that's kind of one example where I try to make it more about the experience, the relational, um, like the experience you have in this world rather than um, this fixed notion of identity. Um, and I, I just really am a person who believes that, um, like my personal experience is that identity is very fluid and it's very relational and um, I hesitate to call myself trans even though I would consider myself non-binary because that is a word that means a lot of different things to different people um, and um, and like I, I know of a lot of trans people who would object to me using the word trans because I um, don't experience dysphoria in the same way they do, or I don't experience, um, or I don't have like a, per like, um, a very um, immediate need to um, go on hormone replacement therapies or, or have surgeries or what have you. Um, or I just don't behave like what, uh, what people expect a trans person to behave like. So yeah, I, I don't know, I guess that's kind of why they started using that trans asterisk thing, monstrosity, but now they've stopped using it. I, I, don't, know what's, I don't know what's going on anymore. Gender, it's yeah. so weird. And, and so, and then sexuality becomes so weird because like, I find, and like you're finding that a lot of people like see, uh, see sexuality as inherently tied to like what gender you're interested in doing. And it's like tied to a particular gender. And um, yesterday on a panel, there was, a, there was a gay man saying that he enjoyed sex with women but could only in emotionally connect to men. And I was like, what the hell does that even mean? I don't know, I don't understand. <laughs> so, so there's that, like um, the words don't make sense anymore. The words don't even make any sense to me. Um, when, so it's just, for me, it's just, it's all about people. It's like the individual relationships you have with others and the relationships you have with a group, like friendships, like Porbentine was saying, that was, it's exactly that. And, and experiences. Um, I, uh, I have played too many games where like they ask me what my sexual orientation is or, at the beginning, or like they ask me, um, or, or they ask me like, uh, what gender are you interested in your love interest being? And I'm like, I, I don't know, okay, I'll just pick one. And then, uh, and then like uh, somehow, and then like, so that plays out and I'm like, wait a minute, I don't really want to romance this person at all or this person and I wish there were more genders for me to choose from. Can I go back and change it? I don't, I don't know, like, I don't know if uh, this, this really, this doesn't really ring true to me anymore. People are people. It's interesting because, I mean, we live in a society where for marginalized or minority groups to have any say in um, having rights, you have to form a category, right? So, but the moment you form a category, you are going to marginalize and disenfranchise even more people. So, um, one of the things, and from a coding standpoint, if you're thinking about writing, it's actually easier if you don't put categories on things because if you open up the experience for where any reader can do anything they want, you have less coding on yourself, so it's easier not to do that. So I've actually I'm starting a new series for Choice of Games, and it takes place on um, in an, a, like a, another galaxy where there's this sacred um, prison planet where all different aliens kind of drop their um, 
either they're like best warriors or they're worst criminals. Um, and you play as a character and you come from this planet that's kind of like a backwater planet where everyone on the planet can uh, absorb the abilities and memories of everyone else. So um, it is a place where everyone kind of understands the experience of everyone else because you're everyone's at each other's heads. But the problem is on this planet, everyone's exactly the same. So it's a super homogenous population where everyone understands everyone else, but everyone's the same. So you take that character who can um, be anything and understand anything and drop them in a place where they're suddenly experiencing diversity and a lot of really interesting things happen. Um, and it also makes it a lot easier for me as a writer because then I don't have to say, okay, you're only male, you're only female because you can absorb this alien or you're a lizard sometimes because you can do that. Um, and it makes it a lot easier for me as a writer because um, I don't have to worry about, okay, this person said that they were only attracted to men at this point, so I can only have them have male romances if you're, um, and hopefully that's where society will eventually get itself as part of where I'm, what I'm writing towards is where we defy categorization and everyone kind of is who they are. And I, I think writing about experience is a really important way to put it. And that's what writers have always done, you know, since the beginning of time is represent experiences, not categories. So I had one more question and then I want to take more questions. Actually, I want to take a question from the audience right now. So someone just raise their hand. Come on, anybody. You have to fight. Please <laughs> form a queue if you want. Uh, what other reading, media, um, games, etc., would you recommend to fans of your works? So, sorry? What other reading, media, or games, etc., would you recommend to fans of your work? What should we play? What should we watch? Oh. What should we read? What do we absorb? God. Someone else answer this first. I, I, I have one. So um, one of my favorite little games from last year uh, was called um, Benthic Love. Did anyone play this? I don't think it yes. got nearly Is the that the cuttlefish visual yeah. novel? It was described as a, like the first gay cuttlefish? anglerfish dating sim or something like that. <laughs> cuttlefish um, is cute. But <clears throat> the premise was you're a male anglerfish, and the way angl anglerfish have sex is the males are very small, and they bite the females, and then are slowly absorbed into the female's body, and then the female can use the male sperm to fertilize her eggs. So you play as a male anglerfish who's setting out into the world, also, male anglerfish can't eat, so they can only they only like live long enough to find a female and mate. Um, you play a male anglerfish setting out into the deep, dark ocean, uh, uh, and you're filled with this existential crisis of like, do I want to do this? Doesn't this mean I'll die if I have sex? But my only purpose is to have sex, so I that must be what I want to do. But what if I want to latch onto a male anglerfish instead? What does that mean? And you have all these like existential conversations with other deep sea creatures, and it's actually surprisingly moving. Like I found myself <laughs> crying while I was playing this game about the fate of this poor little anglerfish. Um, so um, yeah, benthic love. Uh, I, I would recommend that. <laughs> other recommendations? Man feels. Hmm? Man feels. <laughs> I just had to. <laughs> um, recommendation. Uh, oh, were you sorry? Were you going to say something? I was. I was. I've. I was. Go ahead. Sure. You can go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, I don't know. I guess just like a lot of stuff. I've been. I'll just go through the categories. I've been reading. Um, I mean, like I read Nevada, and that was really good. And I um, read. Uh, High Life, and I read uh, The Sluts, and those are the three books that I really liked that I last read. Um, musically, I like a lot of like chopped, screwed, like R&B and pop, and like um, like SCA, and um, let's see, uh, movie-wise, I really liked Upstream Color recently, uh, and Paprika, Mind Game, uh, Under the Skin, has anyone seen Under the Skin? Yeah. It's about Scarlett Johansson, and she is an alien, and she um, drives around in this car in Scotland, and she picks up uh, male presenting hitchhikers and seduces them and takes them back to her lair, where she drains their organs and <laughs> and, and, and can... The, the reason for taking all the stuff that's inside them is because it's an exotic meat for her alien uh, corporation overlords. And um, anyways, like she has deals with like chronic pain and dysphoria because she hates being an ugly human, and she had to like have all this surgery to like look like a human so she could lure people in. And it's really cool. It's really cool. They um they use humans as cattle. 
So the panelists are too modest to recommend some of their own games, uh, but I have no such qualms. <laughs> uh, uh, Squinky, uh, just a few months ago maybe, uh, published a Twine game. There's a ton of fantastic Twine games. Uh, too many to pick any one, but I'm going to. I'm going to uh, pick a... So it's pronounced parallel, but it is spelled with two forward slashes, and good luck Googling that. Uh, but you, if you go to, to Squinky's website, DeirdreKI.com, it's uh, right up there. Uh, and it tells a story of two, two lives of two people, or it seems to me the two people, who are having a hard time figuring out how they fit in with, with traditional gender norms and stuff. That's one that I would call out. All right, so Thank there's, you. More good. there's more people lined up. Uh, so I, yeah, I was just wondering, like, it, I guess the core question is, is being able to customize your character's identity uh, even worth it anymore? Because uh, as you mentioned, uh, Christine, like, identity versus experience. Uh, so like, and you know, from a practical standpoint, uh, if you were to like, for to have your uh, player choose the character's identity in the beginning, you can't really, uh, practically like tailor the rest of the entire story to really uh, reflect on that identity. Like you can't uh, like pick, okay, my character's not neurotypical and then everyone else just reacts completely, completely the same as they would otherwise. I mean, in a, in, you know, in a perfect world they would, but you know, st stories wouldn't be interesting in a perfect world. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing is, yeah, um, like even if you do have like a choice of how to, uh, Customize your character in the beginning, like you could like end up end up like leaving out lots of uh, yeah yeah like yeah you mentioned like if you have like a male female option it's like well that's binary it's like where's my non-binary options <laughs> and if you also have a non-binary option it's like well where did they maybe transition from a different uh, gender identity or a lack of gender identity what's going on yeah. to try like like just have a player like create a graph in the very beginning of the game. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so. I guess like the dilemma or the question is, is it really worth uh, letting a player customize their character in the beginning or creating a story that's very tailored to one specific uh, character with all their flaws and like attributes and shenanigans? I find um, that the second way of like exploring like a particular, the view of a particular character um, is a lot more interesting to me. Um, a lot of like interactive fiction writers would object to that being like, but why don't you just write a book? Or why, like, if you, <laughs> if you won't let, if you won't let uh, people like make choices about who they are, why not just write a book? But the thing is, you can. There are a lot of choices you can make within like a particular view and sometimes even constraining those choices like, you can in explore the entire possibility space of a particular character in a particular situation, and I find that really fascinating. There I'm are, oh. I, I, it's, it's, I'm fast, I promise. There are, uh, there are also advantages to having identity. Sometimes, I, for example, my brother's girlfriend's mother, who, who's led a very sheltered life, accidentally played Heroes Rise as a, as a lesbian. Um, and accidentally. Got to, like, accidentally, like accidentally chose, didn't know what she was doing at first and chose to be lesbian and then had a whole like lesbian adventure. So, um, <laughs> like, so, um, so there are like some, some positives sometimes because you can, uh, with the identity, if you are willing, hopefully, and the reader is, to go outside of themselves, you can have a different kind of experience just by reframing a few simple categories. Mm. It awesome. definitely like makes it harder to have that experience, though, if you can only like stumble upon it by accidentally doing something. I, like I'm, I've made a lot of games where you have like like the character is just supposed to be the player sitting behind their table, and I've gotten kind of bored of that because um, like ab about half my player base is um, 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 cis straight men and. A, a lot of the times I've, I've discovered like like very early on a lot of my audience like didn't quite get that you know the, this, these are games written by a lesbian um, about um, having romances with women and so they didn't even realize that like this story could be interpreted as being about lesbian romance I've gone more explicit about that and I think the point has gone across but at the same time you're still not like ever learning about that experience like you know, it's one thing to accidentally stumble onto um, um, the mother's um, um, lesbian <laughs> adventures, but at the same time, you could also just make a game where everyone gets that experience, and that way, like people actually get to, you know to learn about this. Like your example, um, 
where someone who is um, um, neurotypical um, might make a character that reflects it. That's just giving that to them who um, might already be familiar with this experience and as it's reflected, and in which case the point the game is shitting on them constantly. <laughs> um, meanwhile, the um, um, cis, white, straight, able-bodied, um, neurotypical player is just going through on easy mode and doesn't realize it. And I think it'll be a much more interesting experience if instead of you know going like trying to do all this possibility space just to make things harder for certain people, you just give those people that ex like you just give everyone the experience that you're interested in expressing. And I think like people can learn that way and also get interesting stories because they're not just the same old ones that they've seen every single time. Mm -hmm. Like if you're making a character a, a person play as themselves, people are generally pretty familiar with how they work, whereas Making, um, making you have to role play a character and still having choices. And um, um, Squinky mentions that interactive fiction is supposed to be like all about choices, but I feel like it's more about just like giving people an experience and having choices just is part of um, reinforcing that experience. It's not about, you know, having 20 branching endings. It's about these are the choices you'll have to make to get to the end of the story. And as a result, um, you know, this is a chance where you can explore what it means to be a person who is maybe not like you or who doesn't have stories told about them. And therefore, like, you don't know what the trans lesbian looks like in the barbarian um, adventure, future, whatever, because you've never seen this particular configuration. And if it's a character generator, half of your audience never will. I think you can definitely design for those experiences with customization. Uh, you know, what, there are some great works of interactive fiction that I feel like they put in a customization <coughs> option and there are people who respond to it because they had the option to do something differently. Uh, <coughs> you know, I, uh, I'm, a big fan, uh, I'm a big fan of the Fallen London game. Oh yeah. Uh, mm. which, do, you want, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, um, uh, Fallen London was the first game I ever played that had um, a non-binary gender option for my character. So I chose it. This is really before I had any idea that um, I myself felt that way. But something about it spoke to me. And, um, and then like, so I'm playing as this character um, and um, I'm, I'm going around, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm like just kind of, uh, I'm, I'm doing the shadowy thief path, but then I'm also like a really, really charming thief and um, I'm just very like, uh, very persuasive and very gregarious and sociable, which is kind of like not really like me at all sometimes, except, but now I can fake it a bit better. Um, uh, and then like, um, and then like uh, I decided, and then like I decided I was able to like have my character sleep with like, men and women and variations thereupon. And it was kind of like, it's like, oh, oh, this is interesting. Like, people are like um, finding me attractive even though they don't know what gender I am or, or what binary gender I am because this is Victorian England. Um, but they are still finding me attractive and this is interesting. I never even thought that was possible. Oh my. <laughs> so, um, uh, I mean, like going out in the real world and trying to uh, trying to enact that kind of life. Um, it's it's more complicated than that. But being able to kind of be in this fantasy world where um, where like I could sort of like live these fantasies and like oh people are actually accepting my gender identity uh, or or like lack thereof and uh, and this is this is really cool. I'm uh, and and this is how and this is kind of like maybe how it should be. One of the things I really liked about how they posed the non-binary gender, non gender option was that, that they said, well, are you male or female? Or how dare you ask me this? Uh, uh, we took a similar option in a game I worked on, uh, Choice of the Dragon, in which you are a dragon who terrorizes the countryside. And we asked you, are you male or female or neither or both or unknown or you would dare to ask me this? <laughs> um, and it's a, it's a way of saying, okay, yeah, no, no, I'm not either of those, or I'm just leaving it ambiguous, but without it being a, okay, clearly I have to enumerate every single possible way to not be a binary gendered person. Uh, yeah. So I, I think it's a really nice way of approaching it. One of the things that I've been trying to move towards in my work is um, 
uh, and I, I do want to say that, so I, I totally agree that um, uh, having the player character of an interactive story be like a very specific person is um, under, is, there are not enough stories like that and I think there should be more. Um, that said, if you are trying to create a situation where there is customizability and the, there's kind of a quantum spectrum of possible characters, um, uh, something I've been trying to do a lot more of lately is um, rather than having like a small number of options, give people like a wide palette of different ways in which they can express themselves along all possible axes. Um, and furthermore, let them perhaps change that palette as they are going through play. So rather than um, saying, you know, what gender are you and what gender are you attracted to, um, being like, you know, at letting people decide what kind of clothes they're wearing, what kind of, you know, mannerisms they have, what, um, you know, where, what places they frequent, just all, all of these different ways in which they can build um, a character identity. Um, and then with the romance options in my games now, it's, it, it's less about, um, uh, you know, are you gay or straight or are you attracted to men or women, more about describing a really interesting character and then being like, are you interested in meeting this character? Are you interested in getting romantically involved with this character? No, okay. And then here's another character <laughs> later on, right? So, um, uh, because that also allows like fluidity. Like maybe um, there is a character who happens to be male and the first time you're like, no, I don't think I'm interested. But then uh, halfway through the game, maybe you're feeling differently or you like something else about this character or whatever. So maybe that option might become more appealing. So I think like, um, I think at last year's panel actually, Porpentine turned me on to a tabletop RPG called Apocalypse World um, that has this really interesting um, construction mechanic where rather than being this kind of throwaway part of character creation, um, uh, lots of different aspects of gender are like integrated into the way you're building your character in interesting ways. Um, it, it was um, expression, like gender, instead of being like, oh, I'm male or female and all these very archaic terms, it was expression, like, do I have like, am I soft or hard or et cetera? Like, well, okay, that sounds weird. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, okay, do I have like a hard body, a soft body, like a lean body, like, um, like just like all these different terms that are just like descriptions of how you present, because that's like so important. Yeah. And yeah. And I think being asked those questions makes you think a lot differently about yourself, about the character you might be making for this game, um, and it's it, it makes something that most people, um, it makes a less interesting choice into a much more interesting creative space, I think. And you can just like choose to be ambiguous. Yeah, there's like so many, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, there are no right or wrong approaches, I think. It really like depends on the game and what you're trying to express. So you asked the question, is it worth it to have customization? I think the answer is certainly maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but but as, a, as, a, as a caveat, like all these tools are really great and like all these like different like ways of co making mechanics that can c complement these experiences are really great, but foremost, first of all, like, it's more about coming from this general philosophy, because like, this general like, philosophy of like, radicalism, because you're not, I don't know, you have to have the spirit and the body, really. Like, you could come up with your own, I mean, if you're coming from that perspective, you can invent your own that are suiting your experiences. Like, it's it's not just about like mechanically reproducing things. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to address kind of an ugly question for a moment. Um, a lot of what we've been talking about here is about the difference between identity and experience. And I feel like a lot of the shared experience that the people in this room and at this convention will have is one of dealing with bigotry. Um, there have been a lot of different approaches to how to include bigotry as a mechanic, as a narrative uh, in, in games. Um, you know, you were talking about uh, how there can even be kind of crossfire uh, between marginalized peoples. Um, and Christine yesterday was talking about how there's this kind of question of whether we need more escapism from the bigotry that we ex experience in our day-to-day -day lives or whether we want to confront that and talk about what that experience is really like. Um, from the perspective of interactive fiction, um, how do you feel you want to 
express the experience of dealing with bigotry for your players? I don't want players to experience bigotry unless the straight players are also experiencing it. Because otherwise, that's just the game like actually just reenacting current oppression, which is like probably the worst thing you could possibly do. Um, like so, like I feel it's very important that if you are trying to model this, like if 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 you are writing about bigotry as an experience, this needs to be something that you're not going to miss because of certain things you did in the character generator, because that way you just you go on completely ignorant and. Meanwhile, the people who already have a pretty good handle on it are the only ones who see it, which is probably pretty bad. I have a follow-up question about that. I, I think you'd made a remark that uh, a lot of players who went through analog a hate story as male might not have realized just how differently mute will treat them if they play as female. Um, so I tried to work around that to some success. I'm not sure, like, I, I still think it's kind of problematic, but there's an achievement in the game for completing um, Mute, who is this, like, horrible misogynist um, love interest. Misogynist, homophobic as well. Uh, yeah, she, she's pretty much hateful in all regards, really. <laughs> um, and if you play through as a, um, as a man, she's completely agreeable. She's totally deferential to you. Um, if you play through as a woman, she treats you like absolute shit. But... The game like draws attention to this, but there, there's an achievement for doing, for doing her route as both. And um, something like um, about 40% of everyone who did her route did it as both, like they got this achievement. I, 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 I can tell this because of the stats. So, I mean, ideally I'd like more people to have noticed that, so I feel like that's kind of like a failure. But at the same time, like there's definitely ways you can have customization and still spotlight this is the character doing two different things. And like the whole reason that's even there at all is just because I want the player to, you know, try both options and see what the massive difference between reactions is. But I, I, I don't know if just having the achievement was enough. I think it's like a little bit too much work. I think it needs to be easier for players to get that experience. For, for me, I, I one of my goals in writing Heroes Rise was if I was going to give, I loved choose your own adventure fiction as a kid, and um, if I had read something when I was 8 or 10 or 12 that allowed me to be a gay character and kind of experience a world where that was okay and everyone was fine with it, it would, it would have meant a lot to me. So that was one of the goals I wanted when I was writing Heroes Rise. I kind of took the X-Men approach to, to bigotry in, in terms of every, everyone has powers in this world, and you end up being one of these power people who has this like new class of powers that everyone's terrified of, and, and you get a lot of hatred and bigotry from that. So it has nothing to do with the kind of traditional reasons you get bigotry, but I did want to include an experience for anyone who's reading of like, this is what it's like to have people hate you for absolutely no reason. Um, so that's the, I took the X-Men approach, which is not terribly original, but, <laughs> but it works. I like uh, portraying microaggressions, which is particularly fun in a game. You can just like, um, like um, I don't know, the big bigotry stuff, like that's, yeah, that's important to deal with. Like um, sometimes um, when I'm writing a story, like I have, it's like, Sometimes I have more trouble dealing with like the big, um, like the big macro like oppressions, but kind of like more of the microaggressions, like say dominate constantly um, being asked um, if they're a boy or a girl or what have you by every NPC character in the game. It's like and then like trying to figure out and like and, and also like deflecting that in, in a multitude of ways and even players getting really annoyed. It's like why do people keep asking that question? And it's like and like uh, and then the, and then sometimes people just think that's bad writing. It's like uh, but it's like no 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 this is on purpose. Um, this is really like this is really what it's like to be um, like asked and put into a category all the time. Um, this is really, like, this is really annoying. I'm annoying you on purpose. Um, I wrote a game called Imposter Syndrome where you play um, a woman of color speaking at a tech conference um, who is plagued with a lot of self-doubt in uh, her interior monologue. Um, uh, so, and um, <laughs> the people who got it really got it. Um, people who experience that kind of self-doubt, even if they are being successful and doing awesome things, um, everyone else was like, 
I hate this character. She just has such bad self-esteem. Why is she so down on herself? <laughs> and then like, and, and also this is a game with very little player agency. Um, there, was a, there was a choice where you're like, do you look at the comments or not? And then it's also a, it's a false choice. You could if you pick the, if you pick the don't read the comments option, it goes like, oh, of course you're going to read the comments, you idiot. <laughs> because yeah, that's um, it's like and then and then some people got upset, being like, no, that was that wasn't a real choice. You didn't give me a real choice there. And I'm like, yeah, that that's how it feels. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's uh, it's a really hard problem, and especially I think um, if you're if you're dealing with a story that's set like in a less tolerant time, right? So like I think a lot of stuff um, like my tendency often, and like Heroes Rise is kind of set in like a slightly near future where like things are much happier and and everything can be great. Um, but so it's really interesting with writing the story set in 50s Hollywood, which is like an incredibly gendered, incredibly um, intolerant uh, time period. Um, and then, so I'm facing this exact question. I don't have any good answers yet. I'm still thinking about it. But um, uh, do you do you write something that lets people have you know read something that's escapist and fun, or uh, is that you know not really honoring the actual issues that were going on and the actual issues people might have with their identity? But I think Christine's comment of not um, having only one path uh, be one where players experience that is super valid too. So, um, so I think. It, you know, it requires a lot of thought, <laughs> is all I can say right now. Mm -hmm. um, and also when you're talking about historical fiction, this is slightly off on uh, tangent, but there's also this issue of, are we just looking at like the completely dominant narrative that's going on here? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, 50s um, Hollywood is, uh, is, is probably a great example because it's clearly not as straight laced as the image is supposed to be presenting. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, I had the same thing in Analog, which is about history, but it's like looking at the people that history is not written about. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, like, escapism is probably out of the question, but at the same time, you can, like, definitely, you know, um, look at um, these sort of um, um, either social environments or identities that would sort of sweep under the carpet. Right. But we're still definitely, like, allowed to exist. Right, right. Another great approach to bigotry was in your game, um, uh, Don't Take It Personally, Babe, It Just Ain't Your Story. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also set in the slightly near future, uh, I, I think, where uh, I, I believe a plurality of the characters, it's a high school setting game, are gay. Um, but there is just one bigot who is in the minority and is getting increasingly frustrated at how no one is participating in bigotry with her. Uh, it, uh, she has some colorful language she uses to describe it, <laughs> but uh, she feels like she's constantly being surrounded by gay people who are, who are being mean to her for no reason other than she's being mean to them constantly all <laughs> throughout. Uh, and just sort of isolating her and putting her in a box and making it obvious that she's the villain here uh, really tells a story, I feel like, for the rest of society. I don't know, I, f I feel like that was kind of a failure on my writing because she's not really supposed to be a hateful bigot, she's just hateful. Like, and, and not like, she is just specifically trying to hurt the gay couple. She is just specifically using like, what's gonna work. She would be just as angry if her, um, her ex-boyfriend was with a woman. She is like, just deliberately trying to break them up. And it's like, I, I feel like it's not really exploring actual bigotry, which is always much more complex than that. She is just, that, that character is just a, a, a destructive force of nature, really. <laughs> I, I don't think there's anything to learn about her, from her about dealing with like actual bigots who are usually much more subtle and more effective. Yeah, I, I feel like it's not good for learning about dealing about bigotry. I feel like it's a good example for the sort of people who might have wanted to be a bigot and be like, this is what, this is what will happen to you. This is what Someday. you look like. <laughs> yeah. You look like the worst person, the yeah. worst the pettiest person. Yeah. Well, it's really important to realize that like bigotry or whatever isn't like these people that you can just point to as being the, the bad ones or whatever. It's everyone. Everyone is bigoted because you're born bigoted. And by kind of creating these cartoonish constructs, it really is erasing one's own responsibility. Um, and like people have said, it it's the subtle stuff. Like I barely, I don't get a lot of people like throwing slurs at me, but I do get a lot of people achieving the effect of those slurs with 
uh, euphemisms and whatnot. Like, there's so, so many microaggressions that I deal with, and we don't have a lot of narratives around those microaggressions and just uh, hurtful things. There's, there's a line of Thank you. folks behind. Hi. Hello. So I was just curious on your thoughts on my experience with RPGs and interactive fiction, where I love finding stories where I can be queer or bisexual or cripplingly shy or and things like that, oh, where I have a lot of serious health problems and things like that that really influence how I experience being around people. And that really affected how the fact that I don't comprehend gender, I don't understand it, but I just think people are wonderful. So when I interact with people in RPGs, I try to get my experience, but that's never really possible because nobody seems to quite understand that regardless of all my trying and researching and all that, I can't comprehend something I've never experienced. So I was curious about what you think about how the various things that you've experienced and parts of your personality interact with your sexuality and your gender. Yeah. I, I want to jump in. You seem like the sort of person who I would want to play a game written by you. That I, I was actually thinking the same yes. thing. I was like, uh, yes. where's your game? Very much. Yeah. I'm, actually, I'm working on learning how to write. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You, um, yeah. So, um, uh, can you repeat your question again? <laughs> sure. About yeah. how uh, various experiences you've had in your life and your childhood, your personality, and things like that interact with your sexuality uh -huh. and your gender, and that influences how someone of the same sexuality who had a very different childhood would be, have a very different experience. Yeah. Well, oh, that's I'm, a tough one. I'm a person of color, for one thing. Um, uh, I'm uh, like, I'm half Persian, half Filipino, um, born and raised in Canada. Um, uh, that has definitely um, affected a lot of the ways in which, like, like, it took me um, a long time to accept uh, my queerness because all the other queer people I knew as a teenager were white and they didn't understand what it was to have a particular family background um, uh, where like both my parents' cultures, like same-sex relationships of any kind are um, unacceptable for the most part. Um, and, uh, and also like, and also never and, and also everything is just very gendered too like i couldn't um i had i had no idea that um i was like neither like that i didn't fit into the gender binary um i got like uh, until i was like in my mid 20s like it's like i spent most of my life being like uh like i like okay, everybody's telling me I'm a girl, so I guess I am, but I don't really, I don't really care one way or another, and I don't feel like a boy either, and like a lot of experiences um, I find of um, like especially female assigned at birth gender queer people like me is that they usually go to this, um, they, they usually go through this phase as kids where like they, they like, act like complete tomboys or whatever and and uh, I didn't get that I was just dressed really girly because that was like the like what people did in the culture I was from I had my I had my ears pierced when I was six months old <laughs> that's just what you do in that culture it's really like and and yeah like and then just this whole thing like um like and then people would ask me, like, uh, it's like, okay, well, if your family doesn't accept you, um, why don't you just, like, be like, fuck them and go off and make your own family? And I'm like, no, you don't understand. You don't understand what family means to me. And, and you don't understand what it, like, what, what it means in the cultures I was raised in. You, it's different. It's very, it's, it's really, like, and... And even now, it's hard to find people with those common experiences. And um, it's, and I mean, like, yeah. And and 
and I can't like I, I can't really say that things with my family are perfect, but I mean like things things are getting better, but it's still this enormous struggle of like understanding and and also and also getting other like people in queer communities to understand what what people go through and so that's 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 one thing that's really affected me. Hello. Um, so my question is about creating a character for a general public. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a game developer, and um, also happens that I'm the writer of, the, of my team. I so far, I mean, I like al always trying to include uh, GLBT stuff in in my games. I've been able to sleep things through the cracks so far. But I would eventually like to add um, uh, transgenders or transsexual characters. But my objective is also to, for people that are not from the community to understand that they are that. But I don't want them to be like, you know, like you said, like dropping from a helicopter, hey, I'm transsexual. So <laughs> like, uh, since I don't have that experience of being a transsexual or transgender, and I don't have friends because I live in a country where they are not very present, um, like, how could I do that? How, what, you know, what do you suggest? That's my question. Uh, write a character who happens to be trans, and like, um, do you mean like uh, you personally lack the experience to, to know how to do that, or that other people would lack the experience to recognize? I, what I would like is um, to other people to understand that they are transgender or transsexual, that that is normal, but that they don't like explicitly, you know, like, hey, I'm trans. I guess there's a lot of ways to do that. I mean, like, it depends on like the, the medium. I mean, okay, like conveying that someone is trans is like really complex and like it, everyone has a different way of being trans. Like, you know, you can't always tell sometimes due to the nature of societies we may live in, you know, it's really obvious, but that's like a hugely contextual thing. Um, like, okay, for me, when I think about my own personal experiences, I think like, oh, like I take estrogen once a day, I take Spiro twice a day, maybe you'll see me with like my little, you know, hormone vials or whatever. Um, I have features associated uh, with masculinity or testosterone or whatever. Um, my voice might be a different, you know, pitch from so basically the, the norm. Answers. Those are just some potential details. Yeah, those are some potential details. Yeah, what, what I was going to say also to answer the question before is that one of the, we can talk about categorization and, and all that and identity, but one of the things that's universally true of writing and gaming and whatever is that the more specific you make a detail sometimes, the more universal it is, which is a tricky thing to do. But um, I mean, everyone has kind of human shared experiences. And what I found is that if I'm worried about something, if I just get really personal and what, what was this experience like for me, someone's going to connect to that. Not everyone, but... Um, the more personal and, and specific you are with yourself. Sometimes it translates to being universal, which is a scary thing to do sometimes, but it ends up working out. So we're all human. We all have this. We all know what it's like to have someone not like us or to feel discriminated no matter what your categorization is. So um, drawing from the emotion of how you felt sometimes helps a lot too, I think, even if you don't have the like experience or the knowledge to know what something's like. I think it's very good to all, honestly, I think it's very good to be explicit about this sort of thing because if you're trying to just like leave subtle clues, this sort of, um, well, you, anyone clues. who's playing this who is trans is going to recognize this immediately as that time that they walk into a party and someone stares at them, staring at their features, trying to figure, mm -hmm. what are you? Your voice is yes. deep, so you must not be a woman. They're, like, that's, that's how that's going to come across. So I feel like if you're, like, trying to leave a lot of, like, hints at this, like trying to just like draw at disparate features, I think there is a serious risk that it'll come across that way, whereas, whereas being explicit but not making a huge deal about it is generally pretty, pretty easy to get away with. I mean, the problem I have is that my team is, you know, the, the, you know, the typical straight um, white team. Well, they're European, so maybe they'll accept, but I haven't still tried, you know, like, talking about this because um, we're still a little bit independent so we don't want to like risk it I guess I don't know 
But it's, you, you mentioned you haven't had, had a serious sit-down conversation about it. That's where I would definitely start. Definitely, at least start by talking about it. What do we want to do? How do we want to take this moving forward? If everyone on the team agrees that this is something they want to do, just making it not be your problem but your team's problem is, I think, a, a, an important first step. Yeah. And I think as far as finding people, um, like there are tons of communities online. Like if you're living in a place where it's hard to connect with people in real life, you can um, engage with people um, on forums, talk about, you know, you want to share experiences, you want to, you know, um, talk about stuff. Um, I think that's another place to start. And I think in general, this is never like a strike against your game. Like as, as, as independent developers, like anything that lets you set yourself apart is always pretty much better. And I think like, like the way you pitch this is just say, here is something that makes our story interesting. These are the things that we can explore because we've done this. And I, I think that's not a tremendously hard sell if you look at it that way. I strongly agree. I feel like there's a lot of independent developers who feel like that they need to look as much as possible like other AAA games that they've seen and played, and if they, if they vary off the path at all, then, then they won't make it big like they want to. But in fact, that's completely the opposite of the correct marketing yes. path for, for small independent developers. Yes. You want to show how different you are, because that's the only reason someone's going to write about you and talk about you and share your game with other people, that this is something really unique and different. Uh, and so I feel like if you get your team on board, you're at least halfway there. Yeah. Thanks. No problem. Um, so we've, 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 we've talked a lot. Um, I think it's kind of like with the terms male and female, like we've talked about that. Um, I mean, both in like, like interrogating it and just like kind of using it in terms of like character options. And I know that like in a space like this, we all kind of understand like how complicated those terms can be, just like male and female. But like when we put those options out and just like with sort of like the, the, the broader public, like there isn't that understanding and there's a lot of things that don't necessarily go together that are assumed to go together that are all wrapped up in that term. Um, it's very essential. And I was wondering if like, because we, we, talked, we talked about like making like sort of blank slate protagonists or making like specific experience protagonists um, and also kind of ways to like broaden the gap. But I was wondering if like rather than like making a specific protagonist or like broadening, broadening the customization options to include like, like cis male, trans male, cis female, trans female, generic, non-binary other. Um, I am so um, not generic. What's that? Oh no, I'm sorry. Like in the... <laughs> Not to say that. I'm just teasing. Of the programming <laughs> a lot of options into like into like a customization thing. Like like what would it what would it look like to have like a customizable game that acknowledges but refuses male and female, or like the problematic, not necessarily as a personal identifier, but like the larger system that we understand that. Means. Um, probably focus on like expression instead of like the terms involved because like the terms themselves are like pretty determined by a ne neoliberal Western society and like that inflicts its versions of transness on the rest of the world, its versions of LGBT on the, on the rest of the world um, instead of assuming that maybe they have their own valid uh, systems and terms of their own. But um, yeah, I'd, like we were talking about Apocalypse World earlier, like expression, like l focus on like the things that you like to project about yourself, not those terms. Yeah, I think it wouldn't be, yeah. I would love to see a game that does that because if you think about like character customization screens in RPGs, like for like facial features and stuff, right? It's like you choose like male or female and then you have a bunch of sliders, but like there's not really any reason you could just have the sliders, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, um, so I think um, uh, it's, it's, it's hard socially, but I think technically it's not that hard at all. And like pronouns is another thing that comes up, but like you can write without using pronouns. It's maybe like a little awkward, but that's also a surmountable problem, I think. So I think there are, are um, I would love to see a game like that. Maybe we should. Yeah, <laughs> I, um, I feel that like, Especially if you have like really iconic looking characters like uh, like me's like um, when that Tomodachi Life thing was going on, I was kind of like, well, it's like yeah, of course they should they should totally have gay marriage in that, 
but why are we even gendering these cartoon characters at all? <laughs> like, um, the whole thing was that like, you could make a, like, a female character look really, really male if you wanted to because the customization options were so, um, were so extensive. The only thing was you couldn't give like, certain people facial hair or what have you. But it's like, okay, why is there, why is that, there that artificial limitation? Why don't we just like, okay, these are like just very, very like generic looking people um, and like why don't we just like give them the entire toolbox of clothing and hairstyles and facial hair and what have you and just like pick and choose, mix and match all of the above and, uh, and, just, and just have some fun. Yes. I, th I think it's also important to understand what your goal is and, and understand that as long as you know what your goal is, it's okay. So I have so much respect for a lot of the work on this table that I could never do myself. I know for me, um, and I, I, I'm a TV writer, so I, my goal is to bridge the kind of form a bridge between people who are, have absolutely no idea about cultures and kind of pull them in. So I'm never going to be the one who's going to have the radical representation necessarily because A, I don't have that experience and B, um, it's not my goal to, it's, it's my goal to get people to kind of come in there. So I think it depends. Right. I mean, I'm not saying that like no, no, no. she needs to have like a gender lecture attached to it, but like just why give them the option to like reify problematic shit? Right, yeah, and for me, the answer is to like go into space and create a different society where the rules are different, so I don't have to deal with that necessarily. So you're going to play as a character who you can pick a gender, but then I'm going to have you absorb a female's experiences and memories, and you're going to have like, to understand. What does that mean, like females? Like, we just did that right there. Like, like what do you mean by like And a females? lizard, and a transgender, and all different kinds of experiences. A female what? <laughs> and I'm coming from a place where I know I'm going to have readers who, are, who understand these categories and feel that these categories are necessary. So I'm going to work with them to try to get them to understand that they can go beyond those categories. I think I'm missing the part where you go beyond, but, but I'll trust. OK. Hello. Um, so uh, obviously, a lot of people uh, who are attending this, this con um, are not as you welcome in like AAA or professional gaming industry spaces, but luckily there are a lot of tools now for like for creating games and making IF like Twine or Inform7 or Game Maker or I guess proprietary software. Um, like uh, I was wondering if maybe the panel could talk a little bit about your preferences or about how the different systems might change how we approach these discussions when you're making a game in different in these different systems. Um, I really obviously like Twine a lot. I think it's super accessible. Um, I also use Game Maker. Uh, I've used Inform 7. I used to, Inform 7 was probably the first thing I ever used. I made some kind of cool stuff in it, but I really clicked with Twine. Uh, I use Game Maker to make graphical stuff, and those are kind of like my tool twos, my two tools, Twine and Game Maker. Um, what do you think? I find I've been really influenced by Twine, not from like the actual tool, just like um, because it's so accessible. We've seen like so many different, um, like like we see like like a lot of like like more poetic stuff made with it, and like that's like just like massively um, um, inspirational and influential. And seeing like more people um, actually being able to express their voices that aren't, um, you know, the sorts you normally find even in interactive fiction, I find has um, like given me a lot to work with. So even not using these myself really has a big impact on my work. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. Um, just knowing that a new tool exists, um, like, uh, oh, what's it called? Puzzle, the, um, puzzle script. Puzzle, puzzle script, script, right? Like, that was, um, uh, I thought, super interesting. And I've never made a game in puzzle script, but seeing the kinds of stuff that people were doing with it um, from that basic framework um, was really fascinating to me. So I. Um, and I think it does affect the kind of games that you think you can make um, and that you expect the audience will look for and things like that. Um, uh, I, I have been, so the last couple games I've made have been entirely custom um, systems, um, which takes a lot of time and you spend a lot of your time dealing with frustrating you know, stuff that, that doesn't have anything to do with your story, so um, I wouldn't uh, recommend that. Something I would like to get better at doing is finishing those projects with not only the story I made, but also tools for other people to make things using that same framework. Because I think the more, like having a thriving ecosystem of different tool sets um, is yeah. uh, really critical for um, letting people express themselves in as many different ways as possible, I guess. So, um, so anyone who is working on a tool and is not sure that it's done yet and doesn't want to show it to anyone, throw it up somewhere and make a post about it. Because even if 
even if it's buggy and not finished, someone else might say, oh, that's perfect, I want to help with this, or oh, that gives me an idea for another tool or whatever, so get, get the stuff out there, I think is what I would say. Yeah, I've been doing the roll my own thing for um, my last couple of big projects. Um, uh, but even then, it's like, um, uh, yeah, Dominique Pomplamos was entirely done in like Flash and Action Script. Um, and um, my current project, Coffee and Misunderstanding, is all in JavaScript. Um, so these are like, um, it's kind of like this middle ground between like, all right, I'm not doing like any serious heavy engine code, um, but. There are tools that like, um, uh, but I can I can program. I mean, like I can program enough that um, I know when I need an adult. Um, and uh, so uh, it's basically like um, I'm all about like using whatever weird things are available to you, and that's not just programming, but other things you have like. If you play music, like incorporate music into your game somehow. If you knit, incorporate knitting into your game somehow. Yeah. Um, and like just draw and like take your inspiration from all sorts of weird places. Like um, I was having a conversation with some folks about how like all my hobbies wind up turning into work because I keep <laughs> incorporating my hobbies into my work just because like it's like. Oh, I get, I got, I get inspiration from the weirdest places, and this is great. That said, sometimes if I just want to make a game with a bunch of links in it, Twine is what I will go to because it is like the best thing for that right now. Uh, one question, one follow-up question I want to ask about that. I don't know if anybody wants to take this. Uh, what kind of stories might be better written in something like Twine? What kind of stories might be better written in Inform? What, you know, what? How would I just, presuming I'm willing to take the time to learn either one? Which kind of stories are going to be right for which kinds of tools? Um, well, Twine is very unembodied, and Inform is very embodied because Inform is like for making parser games, like you know, cliche example, Bizork or whatever, or Galatea, and it posits the idea of like a room with bodies, with props, and Twine is just like a void, and you're populating a void. And I always found that very interesting, how you can just make things emerge from it. It's like being this kind of like creating light in a dark room. And I always found that very beautiful. Uh, as for the kind of stories you can make with it, I don't know, I found stuff where, I don't know, I can be much more fluid and adaptive with it than uh, with Inform. Like I'd say experimental stuff is really good in Twine, like poetic stuff is really good in Twine because like, like, I don't know, they had, a lot of poetry is like the juxtaposition of like really like uh, visceral uh, fragments even, like even prose poetry would be the juxtaposition of like stuff that's like not necessarily connected in the way that it would have to be connected in Inform. Um, although people do cool experimental stuff in Inform, but you have to kind of rest a little away from that, I feel, perhaps. Yeah, the whole thing about having a world model, um, which is what like the embodiment is all about. Like you are modeling a world, you are modeling a room, and it's like you are like telling the system that there is a room and that there are people in there, and these people have all these various attributes. Um, and then one cool thing you can do with that, um, like I don't like uh, not maybe not necessarily with Inform in particular, but I guess um, in uh, but like. The, the, the most interesting potential for creating a more embodied um, space is in like having AI and letting, letting, think, letting emergent behavior happen in the simulation, things that you wouldn't expect. Um, and um, that in itself is a sort of like queering of um, like storytelling and, uh, and like game design and behavior. Like um, sometimes like, emergent behaviors were happening that you, the author, were not expecting, and you can be like, huh, interesting. And Aaron actually probably has more uh, interesting things to say about that. Yeah, I would agree. I, I just, I want to say, I like, um, uh, I really thought Porpentine's description of the difference between like trying to inform was really beautiful. But Agreed. I like thinking I like of, that. Uh, you, you almost met, think of like inform and parser-based stuff as being sort of like um, more connected to traditions of like, Aristotelian drama with like unity of like time and space because uh, there's also like the notion of like each turn is like the same duration of time yeah. since the past yeah. one um, with Twine being more um, uh, descended from poetry where things are more free form and there might be 
10,000 years between two screens, or the time might not even matter between two screens, or, um, so I think that's kind of an interesting dichotomy between those two. Yeah, I mean, both well, are really great and fascinating. Meanwhile, I'm doing visual novels, which are basically just all talking. Um, I've sort of hacked into RenPy, um, the ability to read documents, but it's still like, it's all about like conversations, conversations are what drives things. And there's definitely like a notable absence of some tools that would certainly be available in both Twine and Inform or something else that are just like completely absent. Like I can never really tell a story about a place. Like my games are always very geographically nebulous because it's hard to give a sense of space when you're conveying everything through a series of conversations. And I feel like, like that's definitely a limitation. Like you have to tell stories that are entirely, they're entirely told through people talking to each other or sometimes you read a document, but never like you actually know like where are you? What, what, what is this place that you're in? What is the world? Rather you can only focus on the people in it. Conversations between continents. Continent conversations. <laughs> right. I, I want to move on to the next question. Hi. Hey. <laughs> um, so I'm asking this because classically I think it's done pretty poorly, but um, when you're writing outside of your own personal experience, um, it's usually typically easy, like, let's say like punching up and punching down, right? It's typically pretty easy to, to write up, right? Or oh, write yeah. um, about yourself sometimes, but like what about writing sideways or writing down? Um, writing on people that are like less privileged than you um, in a way that's not totally fucked up or colonizing or whatever. Fortunately, I have a lot of punching up I can do. Like um, I've written stories about white women and white men and, uh, and um, yeah. And I mean like um, actually for a while, like um, I didn't really want to write about like my own personal experiences as much because like I wanted a bit of distance. It actually like, um, like the first writing I did was all about, we this is so weird, it was all about like, um, like just uh, like white straight cis people and it's like because that's like what all the media I had absorbed was all about so it's like oh like and then like when you're just starting out you kind of go through this emulation phase and you're writing from like the perspective it's like you think that that's what writing is and so you do that and then like sometimes like it takes a while for you to be like uh, to be like oh um, I can work in my own experiences in this too and like that was kind of a huge revelation for me um, so I guess my answer to that question is um, I haven't really needed to <laughs> I feel very much the opposite um, I, I, I don't think my experiences are actually like really interesting enough to need to be shared. I, I, I feel like there's much more value in like exploring other experiences. Like I, 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 I don't need to make a game about what it's like to be me because I, I feel like people have like a pretty good idea about that. I did once write a game that was about my own experience and honestly it's, it's I, I think it's the least interesting thing I've done. I didn't learn anything from it and probably no one else did either. I'm much more interested in um, you know, like the question isn't like writing about your own experience or punching up, down, sideways, whatever. It's I just don't about like that word punching either. It wasn't yeah, really no. that, that didn't really like work. I, I yeah. well, I, I think it was just an analogy. Yeah. Sorry, that, 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 that was my <laughs> slip of phrase. But you know, the the point being that I'm not really interested in the hierarchy so much as like what are the voices that we're not listening to? Uh -huh. Why not? And how if if, if it's impossible to hear them on their own, for example, writing about historical Korea, um, it's, it's, it's hard to interview people who are around. So instead you have to sort of explore that on your own and try to imagine what it's like to be in that situation and empathize with that and, um, you know, um, project yourself into experiences that are not necessarily your own, I think has like so much value. How do you, I want to ask about Korea in particular. How do you feel like you were writing about Korea and Korean culture without, you know, like, you know, uh, I think the, the question asked her talked about, you know, like sort of colonizing, you know, sort of meifying anything I'm writing about. Or maybe that, that's, that's part of the writing process. Um, that was always my fear. Like, Analog is like a heavily researched game. The, um, the, the stack of books I went through to, you know, make sure I got things right and make sure I had a good impression of things was enormous. But partially it was also just like, I don't know 
So it became very important to me that I have to translate this game to Korean because it has to withstand scrutiny mm. from um, you know, the people it's, it's about. Otherwise, that's like probably one of the worst things I can do. So like, oh, a lot of like, um, um, people commercially interested in me are like, why'd you do the Korean translation? Is there a big market? It's like, no, it's just, if I'm making a game about Korean history, I better be available to have people who, who come from that history tell me that I'm full of shit or not. <laughs> and um, the, the reception was positive, thank God, I, I, I did get it right, but I, I feel like, like putting yourself up for that criticism is super important. Yeah, I, the, uh, really good piece of advice I got about that once is, um, yeah, do your research, right? Um, uh, uh, but if you're writing about someone who's different than you, um, you need to be willing to be corrected by people who have had the experiences that you haven't had, right? Um, so rather than getting defensive if someone calls you out on something, um, take that as an opportunity to, um, to learn more and you know, um, do things differently or, or whatever in the future. And another thing, lastly, would be to maybe sometimes just not write about those experiences and instead amplify uh, someone else from those experiences who is creating, because they are there, but they are probably not getting a lot of press. That's a great point. So I think we have just a few more minutes. Um, I see there's another person. Um, it's for uh, a lot of your work, it seemed, I mean, previously, uh, seemed to get to really know what you're for our specific sites and like subcultures to go to like get this kind of work to play it. But kind of in the last year and then also really recently, like it's like, oh, a visual novel and oh, this like career point and click and holy shit, a text adventure like popped up on Steam. Um, and while I like play games off Steam, like to me that was like something like I noticed very specifically. So I was curious like how this and possibly other mainstream or like bundles and other things has exposed you to new audiences and like what that experience has been like, that kind of thing. Oh God, the Steam community I, is <laughs> awful. Yeah, I was, I was like, you know, I don't even, I don't even read my phone. I would like, ask, I would like someone to finish the sentence of, oh God, the Steam community, they, because I think a lot of people may not know. It, so it has been one, I mean, I, my Heroes Rise just got on Steam, which is wonderful, and I think it's the first text-based and choice of games kind of broke through, and, um, it has been wonderful that it has opened up to a whole new audience of people who are so excited about it, but it has also opened us up to a whole slew of really vicious, <laughs> vicious people, um, especially because when you're dealing with a text game, people on Steam aren't, aren't used to experiencing that, so a lot of people are coming looking for a much more robust gaming experience than they're gonna get, so um, you just have to be prepared for that, and especially if you're doing something different, you're always gonna have to be prepared for people to love it and people to really hate it, so that, but it's, it's your job to kind of withstand that. I think like um, receiving like in a way like receiving a huger a larger volume of vitriol um, uh, has kind of been a good sign for me like that oh um, uh, my my work is reaching people who aren't like kind of my immediate like circle of friends and other people who are more likely to be interested in my work it's kind of like it's like penetrating out there and people are like and some people like a vocal minority are getting upset about it but a silent majority are actually buying the game and hey cool that's that's kind of neat yay and uh, and like random and then meanwhile more random people are like kind of popping in to say nice things and then I'm like oh hey that was nice and unexpected how do you deal with the trolls I mean I'm just Everybody here, I imagine, is going to need Cry. to deal. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's I, plan B then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I sit on my bed and pet the cats and eat ice cream. <laughs> um, yeah, Sex in the City and ice cream is my personal. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I try to tell myself, good or bad, give as much weight to what is written as they took time to do it. So they probably took, you took a year to write this and they took three minutes to write whatever they wrote. So good or bad, take three minutes to think about it and move on is, is my rule personally. I installed a browser extension that means I can no longer see 4chan. That was the most important thing I've probably ever done in my life. <laughs> just doesn't exist. It's, what is that place? We just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're certainly not saying anything, anything about me anymore because they just, they, don't they just popped out of existence. It's really quite mysterious. Wow. 
I would just add for anybody who does get their game on Steam, I know Valve has said that they want to open up Steam to a lot more people uh, starting very soon. Uh, the Steam forums have uh, a, a lot of moderation tools that you can use to mute posts, delete posts, <clears throat> use them. <laughs> Hire a professional extrovert to do it for you. Yes. <laughs> Someone should be deleting the evil. And there are people who just hang out on Steam who want to post evil just, oh, here's a new game. I wonder what evil I shall post there. I don't know how they found this game unless they were literally waiting, lying in wait to post some horrible, horrible, horrible things. Well, they're always on the front page, so. Yeah, I guess that's, and then they're like, oh, I'm gonna click on that and start. Yeah, but they, they got stuff to say and you don't wanna hear it. Thank you. Have a good support right, system are... is what I would say. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry? I'd say have a good support system because yeah. Like, no one else is going to back you up except for, like, your immediate friends. Like, the only people who are going to be there for you are ultimately, like, you need to have people you trust, people who are your friends. Like, you, because you are building an alternative system that does not really exist yet. Like, every person who is doing something different is, like, yeah, like, you can't depend on this existing system. You need to, like, really, it's, like, growing plants on Mars, you need to have all these tests and like test the soil for like uh, metals and like hydroponics and you need to like develop a, a dome, but that's like a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think we are out of time. Thank you everybody so much for coming. Great questions. Thank you so much for the panelists. <laughs>